welcome to LedgerCast. My name is Brian Krogsgaard, and today we have Clay Collins on the show from Nomics. Nomics.com is his website. Uh, this is an all-encompassing API project where he's really looking to be the data layer for crypto and for maintaining the history of the price of any crypto asset um, previously and going forward. Uh, he believes that there will be thousands and thousands of these assets that need to be tracked, and they're looking to create uh, a hardened uh, layer of data to maintain that price history and integrity. We talk all about this project. Clay is a seasoned entrepreneur, and this is his latest project. He was part of Lead Pages. I think you'll really enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Delta. Go to ledgerstats.com slash Delta to check it out. They have some really great stuff going on right now because uh, they just released live order books and depth charts. It's all in the latest version of Delta. This is one of the most requested features they've had. So I'm really excited to be able to uh, share with my listeners that that's now available because I know a lot of technical traders want to be able to check out the order books, uh, get an idea of depth uh, on the on the price uh, while they're looking at their portfolio. They've got that and so much more. Thanks to Delta for being a Ledger Status partner. Now here's the show. Hello and welcome to LedgerCast. My name is Brian Krogsgaard and today we have Clay Collins on the show from Nomics. He's the co-founder of Nomics uh, and Nomics.com is the website for that. Clay and I have been talking a, a good bit over the past several weeks ever since I uh, pinged him on Twitter looking for information about their API. Uh, hey Clay, welcome to the show. Hey Brian, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked. Yeah, so I was uh, stalking what y'all were building uh, for a bit um, between listening to your podcast and then just kind of checking out, um, you know, your blog post and your newsletter and all that kind of stuff. And then I was actually looking to uh, potentially use your API, and we're going to dig into this about what Nomics is, why you're uh, building what you're building, um, and. You responded to me in like record time, and it required y'all to uh, potentially build a new feature. And you're like, "Yeah, we'll have that like tomorrow." <laughs> so uh, you you piqued my interest for sure, um, purely based on an incredible response time to trying to help someone use the product that you're building. Um, and I'd like you to fill in for everyone else, like what the heck is Nomics at a, a thousand foot view? Yeah, so great question. Uh, there's two components of Nomics. The front end, which is at nomics.com, is is it's a coin market cap competitor. We're going to eventually open source completely uh, the front end as well as um, you know iOS and Android apps. So um, we we really want to open source that, uh, and it's powered on the back end by the Nomics API which is an aggregator API. Um, and not only do we have uh, ticker data, but we have um, multiple candlestick um, links uh, on, on the back end for uh, aggregate markets. So, you know, all Bitcoin markets, all Ethereum markets, etc. And, but we have candlestick data for individual markets, for example, like the ETH to BC, BTC market on Poloniex, for example. So we've got... Uh, aggregate candlestick data, and we have data for individual markets on individual exchanges. And we have every single trade on all of those markets on all of those exchanges going back to the inception of those markets. So uh, if if I can beat my chest a little bit here, I really do think after reviewing all the APIs uh, in this space, we, we hands down, uh, I believe we have the best uh, market data API uh, in this space. Uh, it's fast, it's free, uh, and uh, you can sign up and, and get an API really quickly and, and be in business. And um, something that I think is worth noting is that everything you see on nomics.com is powered by the free version of our API. And we're using the free version of our API. So um, it, there's no back doors, there's no hidden endpoints. Uh, we're consuming this exactly like a customer is. In fact, we went in and we signed up and we got an API key and we just use that API key in, in our app. So we're a big believer in, in dog fooding uh, and being a customer of our own products. And that was one of the rules that we put in place from day one is that we couldn't do anything with our app that our customers couldn't do with the free version of our product. Nice. So at a... Uh... 
at a baseline, you're providing <clears throat> um, data specifically around uh, coin data at a high level and then uh, very specific data in terms of pricing on a daily basis and I think an hourly basis at a uh, at a core. I think what I actually asked y'all about in that thing was whether y'all could do provide either like four or six hour data. So that was something else that y'all were um, looking to add. And now people can use this to build something just like nomics.com or they can use it within a trading strategy if they want to do automated trading um, or pretty much anything else, right? So uh, yep. this yeah, is yeah. essentially just a massive data feed, but Instead of me going and saying, "Hey, I want this data from uh, Poloniex," as your example that you used earlier, you're you're dealing with all the hassles of uh, getting data off an exchange, so that I don't have to integrate with every single exchange in the world. And instead, I integrate with Nomics, and I'm good to go. Yeah. So, so I think you summarized that correctly. Um, I think uh, kind of a company that we're similar to is a company called. Uh, you know, actually, I, I won't get it too much into that. Yeah. So, so basically, um, <laughs> one of the the problem that we're solving for is uh, a problem that kind of came up a lot in conversations when we were talking to uh, hedge funds and family offices and institutional investors, which was um, they'd hire a pretty fancy developer to do data science work to find edge and opportunities in the data sets, and their developer that they'd hire for that purpose would end up spending much of their time uh, rather than finding opportunities in the data set, just maintaining those data sets. So if you spend much time at all ingesting data from these exchanges, you'll find that ticker symbols change from exchange to exchange. And then the exchanges themselves will change uh, ticker symbols. Uh, They'll change their data schemas without telling you. Um, Their data feeds will turn uh, off and then they'll come back on again. There's lots of downtime. And so um, if, if you're just ingesting data from one of these exchanges and you're okay with uh, dealing with just a, a bunch of friction, then I think it's probably okay. The second you want to ingest data from multiple exchanges, uh, things get a, a lot trickier. And when, when we started in this business, um, we, just, we, we started off by integrating with five exchanges and we had 80% of the volume. Uh, now, in order to get fifty percent of the volume, you need to integrate with like twenty exchanges, and meaning like uh, global trade volume for whatever currencies that you're tracking. Exactly, exactly. So you're you're having to integrate with more and more of these exchanges to um, uh, to get a, an accurate picture of what's so the what's long happening. tail. The long tail of uh, global trading is getting larger, basically. Yep. Exactly. So there's there's lots of just real oddities when when integrating with these uh, exchanges. For example, some exchanges, when their APIs go down uh, because of the way their caching works, they just persist the last candle. So they'll give they'll just keep on giving you the same candle over and over and over again. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so um, it, it looks like the same thing's happening, uh, and that's really stupid. Uh, other exchanges do things like um, we were looking at exchange the other day that uh, had a market called USD, uh, uh, it was called USDTUSD. And people were integrating with that and they didn't know, is that, uh, is that Tether to USD? Or is that USD to true USD? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. what the hell is going on here? There's just a lot of bizarre stuff happening in this space. So we wanted to uh, create a, a super professional lightning fast um, API and 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 that's a, that's that's what we're out of curiosity on that exact pair were they basically seeking to provide a trading pair between two uh, different stable coins in order to smooth the market on their own platform? So one of those was a fiat market and one of those was a stable coin. You just didn't know uh, okay. which because yeah, USDT USD could either be USD to true USD or Tether to fiat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, and, the um, blend of stable coins is super interesting to me. Like the way, yeah. and trying to find out like what's what's going to be supported. How do we measure stuff like that? I even saw one uh, the other day where, and I'm sure y'all will start tracking these types of things too. So they are creating kind of index funds on the go, um, hmm. and one of their funds is actually a stable coin blend. Um, so if you buy their stablecoin blend, I guess their whole point is like, 
you're buying the average of all the stable coins. So it'll be a stabilized stable coin mix to be even closer to a dollar. Um, oh there's just a lot of effort going into people trying to ha- call a dollar a dollar in crypto, which I, um, and I think it's, it's perhaps just a, uh, a bit of a signal for how difficult data is in uh, not only this space, but pretty much any space. Um, and I, I'm fascinated by this play because um, there's so much opportunity, I think, as the ecosystem grows. And I never had heard what you said earlier about uh, just how much trading is going on on the long tail. Because when you think about like, hey, where are people trading crypto? You hear the same stuff, right? You hear that they're on Binance and that they're on Coinbase and to a lesser degree, Bittrex and Poloniex. And then you've got some Asian exchanges that are doing a lot of trading, but you don't actually know if it's real. Um, for some of them, uh, like I think Wex recently is like super weird, and t- like Tether was trading for like two fifty a piece or something. Like crazy stuff is going on, Same. and keeping track of all of it is really difficult. Um, I come from a, a development background. You come from a web background. I actually, knew who you were in your prior company, uh, which is Lead Pages, by the way, for anyone listening from the web space. Um, so how did you transition from building a big company, what became a big company with lead pages, uh, to saying, hey, we're going to get involved in, in cryptocurrency and go after this data play? Yeah, so that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So to speak to my previous history or what I was doing before this, um, my, my first software company was a company called uh, Lead Pages that was started in January of 2013. Um, from 2013 to um, 2017, you know, we grew that to about 50,000 paying customers. We raised 38 million in venture capital. Um, you know, hired hundreds of people. Uh, had a really good go there. Something I realized about myself is that I think I cap out at around 100 people <laughs> in terms mm-hmm. of company size and, and my ability to manage at scale, you know, at some point you're managing people and then you're managing people who manage people and then you're managing people yeah. who manage people who manage people. And um and and I really like that that spot of like between, you know, 80 people to to 100 people. Um so, you know, perhaps I can scale beyond that, you know, with my with my second uh software company, but uh at some point I just kind of went to the board and said, "Hey, I think we should hire a CEO and um and and I can Stay on the board. In fact, I I wanted to stay on the board, and um, and so I started thinking about yeah. It's, so, so you're I, on I the board of lead pages today, and uh, but you're not involved in the day to day management of the company. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going into the office. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm officially uh, chairman of the board, but that's kind of a, a nice honorary title I asked for, and they gave they were nice yeah. enough to give it to me. Um. So one of the things that I saw. In the marketing tech space, which was really fascinating, fascinating was just how uh, data got, you know, became more and more distributed over time. So, when you first started using marketing tech uh, in the space, you know, someone would use something like Infusionsoft or HubSpot or Salesforce, and everything would be in one place. But then, as the space exploded, about every single year, the number of martech companies uh, doubled. So folks found themselves, uh, you know, sort of originating in a place where everything was in their CRM or everything was in their uh, email service provider, to a space where they had, you know, open and email open rate and click data and like a Mailchimp, and then they had information about who attended what webinars and a place like Zoom or GoToWebinar, and then they had, um, uh, the, you know, they they had uh, payment data and something like Stripe, and they had. Um, uh, information about what web pages people are visiting in a place like Google, you know, Google Analytics, and over time, the data just got more and more distributed, and it became harder to know what was actually happening in terms of the 360 view of the customer and what they were doing across all these different SaaS products that you were using to run your business. And as that happened, there, you know, there became a, a real desire to integrate all these different systems. And, um, and that became a, a real challenge. And 
um, I, at that time, I got really interested in data platforms and customer data platforms, were, which you know, essentially these data hubs. So essentially, you have your customers in all these different places, and then the hard part is saying, well, this singular customer data over here and this singular customer data over here, we want to bring those together so we can get the profile of who this customer was, both in terms of what they've bought, but also how they've uh, interacted with our website or app, and then also like how they treat our emails and stuff like so they yeah yeah you know, what pages they visited what emails they've opened what webinars they've attended what you know uh, maybe even what, like whether they follow uh, us on twitter or like or something like that all, all all that stuff and tracking their behavior before you even have an email address or some sort of identifier so you know while they're anonymous users on to you know they're they're a customer and then they quit and then they rejoin so all this sort of post purchase information and stitching together a unified customer timeline of everything they did across this timeline. And, um, and I saw the same thing happening in the crypto space. Again, with lots of co- consolidation in, in data at first, there was just a handful of, of exchanges that had most of the volume. And then over time, that data being more and more distributed and hearing from developers that every time they add a new integration to the system, uh, it, it made the system uh, exponentially more complex because they had to deal with these different systems going up and down and the interaction between systems and maintaining the integrations and, and all that. So um, so we are not a blockchain company. We're not issuing a token. This is, this is an API business. This is a really kind of uh, quote-unquote boring business. Um, but I think that's kind of in my DNA. I'm a product person and uh, I'm in this for the long haul. And uh, and and you know, it's kind of these companies that other people find boring, I find uh, immensely interesting. Uh, companies like SynGrid that handle SMTP uh, email, companies like um, uh, AWS, almost these uh, online utility companies that mm-hmm. charge on a metered basis. Um, that's that's kind of my my sweet spot and uh, where where I derive the the most amount of interest. And uh, I think the opportunity for us is that these are often things that. Uh, most people just aren't interested in because they find them too boring. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, what do you you probably know the term for this, but like where uh, degradation in data over time. So uh, I like to use the example of metal just because it's one I remember of being um, listed on Bittrex and then listed on Binance later and then delisted on Bittrex, but it's still on Binance. And this is only over the course of whatever the last year that it's existed. We have no idea how this data might happen for an open source uh, or a, you know open data, open trading data for hundreds or thousands of uh, crypto assets over the course of 10 or 20 or 50 years. And maintaining a, maintaining a source of truth for an asset like that Becomes very difficult. So I've seen people. They, I say metal because you know that's the example I know where it has this history of Bitrex and it was way higher than it ever showed on Binance. And people, I've seen people show a chart of metal on Binance and they're like, "Wow, this thing is so destroyed. Like it's so far off the top." And every time I see someone post that, I'm like, "Yeah, let me show you this other graph." And it's like <laughs> the historical context of metal where it was another five times higher because it was. You know, ICO and listed in the in the height of the uh, crypto boom, but people are essentially lacking information to then make a decision because they don't have all of that aggregated. So one of the things that y'all do, because you're pulling it from uh, Bitrex and Binance, you're piling that into your global uh, average over time, and you're essentially providing uh, data security for this asset and every other. Um, for as long as you exist, you have that central source of truth that someone can use for making decisions, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and you know, one question we get from folks who don't spend a lot of time looking at data is, you know, doesn't Coin Market Cap have this data? Don't you know other sites like maybe Live Coin Watch uh, have this data? And, and they don't. They don't have candlestick data for the most part. Those services are just uh, ingesting live tickers as the data comes in. Uh, they don't have historical trade data. They don't. They don't have the kind of data that that a real trader. You know, would want to observe if if they're going to uh, create a bot, uh, for example. Yeah, they um, may have. I've I've actually uh, poked around several of the APIs that are out there. Coin Market Cap, in particular, um, if you're building some something really baseline where you're okay being somewhat rate limited and you're going to go cash all that, 
um, you can get stuff like 24 hour volume on a coin or you can get like current price or the percentage of the supply that's out, stuff like that. But getting detailed data of everything that's happened um, over the past or the lifetime of the coin, like several years sometimes, uh, gets a lot more challenging with with anything. Um, and then also just the quirks between all the different exchanges and everything that they support. Um, and that seems to be kind of where y'all are attacking this. Um, so I'm super interested in this, but what I am... Uh, what it's hard to to figure out is where the heck are you going to make money and why are you doing this? Because the, everything you do on Nomics.com is actually pretty advanced for someone that at least wants to view and use uh, data. I'm not necessarily trading based on what you have there. Uh, so where do you start to make money? Who do you? What kind of people do you charge? If I can build something yeah. like Nomics.com for free. Yeah. So so we have uh, we have paying customers. Uh, we they're. Uh, Tradition, they're mostly uh, institutional traders, uh, quantitative hedge funds, uh, folks like that. And what they're paying for is the, the raw trade data. So when you want every individual trade, um, then, then you have to pay us. Or if you want some custom integrations, or if you want uh, SLAs and high-level support, or you want us to do some custom, uh, some custom development work for you, and uh, SLA as a service level agreement. So you're yep. saying you'll be up 99.9% of the time. Yep. Or or, nine, um, nine, or three yep. nines, whatever your promise is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're 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 somewhat limited by the APIs themselves, uh, but our, our API is, is always up. And and we don't persist the last candle if their API is down, even though they're doing it. We'll just mark it as a zero and then we'll backfill it. Do y'all do um, data repair? So like yeah. uh okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, they don't. Um, if you're just consuming the live data feeds, uh, they don't repair their data. But we go back in and and uh, and and we get after the fact. So um, so those are the folks that pay us. And and what that allows you to do is it allows you to you know create your own candles. If you decide you want 30, 38 second candles, you can do it because you have the raw trades. You can construct everything. Or uh, something that some folks want are like volume candles. So they don't want candles based on like every hour or every four hours. They want million dollar candles. So they want, you know, for the last million dollars in trading volume, what's the, you know, the open, close, the high, and the low. Um, and, and, and actually, they're doing a lot of stuff that they won't even tell us. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a product person. So when someone buys our product, I'll go in and ask them, you know, what are you, what are you doing with this data? They don't want to tell us, just send it all <laughs> to us and we'll do our proprietary thing. So um, and and you know it's it's that's their strategy. So we're not you know we're we're not going to ask them. Sometimes we get a little insight when we when we do on site visits and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so th- so those are the folks that pay us. Uh, it's five hundred dollars a month for that plan. Uh, pretty cheap in the scheme of things, you know, given the size of folks' d- uh, data budgets. But um, we'll we'll probably move to a metered plan in the future. Okay, so if I'm if I don't. What would a metered plan look like? Like, would that be from there and higher, or uh, yeah. would it just lower the bar? Yeah, it would be. It would be like it just sort of uh, pay as you go. So, all the card. If you want to make uh, a, a lot more calls, then you'll you'll pay for those. Uh, you know, additional exposure to to data. But um, so how do you money? how do you bring exchanges on to participate in this? Um, I know you don't. Yeah. I don't think you have like a hundred percent. Exchange coverage, but y'all have I can't remember what the number was uh, maybe a dozen or a couple dozen exchanges right now yeah we've got uh, we've got about a dozen uh, and the, and the reason why we only have a dozen right now uh, versus having a lot more is uh, for kicking things off, we only wanted to work with exchanges that give us raw trade data, and that allows us to calculate our own candles versus us believing their candles. Like we've just found fraud. Uh, we've I can talk about that for a second. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm on. not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna. You know, name an exchange, but the kind of fraud that we see most frequently occurring is when uh, trades happen like far above the spot price, right? So you've got the big ass. You've got the bid ask spread. You know, you've got the the spot price, which would be a market order. And then you see, <laughs> you see the uh, uh, it, it would be the the bid jump way across the ask <laughs> and purchase something like way over here. So if you see those charts, it's like 
uh, jump it across the gap. And, 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 the, and the, so they'll be really like, you know, like paying some absurd amount for Bitcoin or, or whatever the crypto asset is, but buying a tiny amount of it <laughs> at some insane price. And we're like, there's no way an order book should, should let this happen. So that's, that's what we see most frequently. <laughs> I've seen that uh, specifically when people list a coin, like they do that weird stuff and you see the massive first bar. Um, yep. For some unknown reason, and then two other scenarios I've seen. One was when uh, Binance had the uh, Syscoin hack and shenanigans that they did recently. Mm-hmm. Someone sold eleven Syscoin for ninety six BTC each, um, and I don't know if they skipped through the entire order book, like if it was just thin, so that uh, they spiked it to that level or what. But then the other, the other scenario that I've heard that's fascinating to me is. Sometimes you can do that through Exchange APIs because a lot of times the way you show an order book in a, a RESTful API is actually it shows every single one and then you can pluck like the individual order. So it mm-hmm. allows you to essentially skip uh, skip the order book whereas uh, typically a limit order is going to choose the lowest one or a market order is going to you know pull from the bottom or whatever. But I've heard there are some exchanges where they have funkiness in their API that would also allow something like that. Okay. But, yeah, so, uh, so maybe it isn't fraud. I mean, I, I, it's well, it might be a bad API integration. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Like if, if you have if you have really thin markets and you put in a market order, then it could just be that it just it blew past all the sell orders and jumped to some super high price. Um, but but I could see you know what you're talking about with the APIs. You can you can pluck a, a specific uh, order. Although I don't know why someone would do that. That would just make no sense. So it could just be a, a no crappy idea. programmer somewhere. But I don't know why a crappy programmer at a hedge fund is like buying you know Syscoin for several Bitcoin each. Like I just can't see. In yeah, I think in that example, it was something related to the the hack that they had, and it was just a mm-hmm. hot mess. Um, yeah. I am curious, like y'all have a ton of data between the, you know, the pricing data, candle data, um, you know, exchange rates. I'm just looking through some of your documentation right now. Uh, since you came from a marketing background, how did you even know? Like, here's the data that we need to put into this API. Like, how do you know what to provide and um, and you know how to build it? Yeah, so so uh, so I'm a product person first and foremost. So you know we get it by talking with customers, but we're also traders ourselves. So you know we we know we know it from that perspective, and, and we you know we we create stuff that we want to dog food uh, ourselves. Um, so it's 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 really about in, you know talking to customers a lot, doing stuff like we did with you on Twitter, where you asked for a feature and like okay, we like we're going to build it. Or when we're talking to customers, sometimes they'll say. Hey, we want this, uh, but uh, in order for this to really work for us, we need you to add this additional thing. So it's it's just about you know talking with the customers all the time, and and I'm I'm on the phone multiple times per week with institutional traders, uh, developers, and uh, trying to learn everything I can about making a solid product. And I, I think you know I, I think um, kind of the DNA you have to have to make this kind of product is is very different from the you know the average product in the space. There's a lot of hackathon developers. There's a lot of like kind of uh, young dudes in their 20s spitting stuff up over the weekend. And to create like a data product and a data platform, I think um, it, 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 it requires a certain level of discipline. So to kind of put this into perspective, uh, we have 100% unit test coverage on the front end and the back end. So... Um, every single line of code uh, has a unit test that that uh, that covers that code, which means for non programmers, <laughs> that means that what he says is going to happen has been tested via a whole other uh, slate of programming tools to verify that that's what happens because he said it was going to happen. I don't know. Yeah, if like I'd we we, that well. we we have just as much code. Uh, Testing the app as the app itself, <laughs> yeah. uh, which mean uh, which means that myself as a non developer. Um, my my CTO or someone else on the team will often uh, send me a version of the app, and I'll deploy it. I'll I'll log into GitHub and deploy to production without anyone manually testing it. So mm-hmm. it's just a certain level of rigor. It, it it it's not something that most people have the stomach for because it's slower at first, but uh, it pays off in, in spades down the road. Let's take a break to say thank you to our partner for this episode, Delta. 
Go to ledgerstatus.com slash delta to check it out right now. This is the best way to track your portfolio in crypto, bar none, guaranteed. Go to ledgerstatus.com slash delta. Hey, you know they've got some great new features. The last two releases have just been chock full of stuff. Uh, live order books and depth charts. Number one on the request list for people that I've talked to who said that they like Delta, but they want more. That's the biggest thing they've wanted. You've got that now. Uh, I think they support like a dozen exchanges uh, so that you can see the the actual order book, the depth charts, recent trades, all that stuff right there in the app. It's really great. And then uh, they just released portfolio analytics as well. And I've thought this is really cool because I can go back and it'll actually tell me if I'm a pro user, uh, it tells me even more. Um, but it tells me stuff like um, what exchange are my coins on or where, what wallet is it in. And it gives me these really nice graphs with all of that information uh, with a lot of analytical data. And then it also even tells me, hey, what's a good trade or a bad trade? So if I sold something and... Uh, it's gone down since then. It'll tell me, hey, that was a good sell because it's gone down since then. It gives you some insights on your past decision making to let you know if you've done uh, a good thing or a bad thing with that trade. And just give you a, a little more uh, information about your trading and so that you can learn more to be a better trader. Delta is really awesome. They're always working on cool stuff. Uh, go to ledgerstatus.com slash Delta. And thanks so much to Delta for being a Ledger Status partner. Somebody may be listening to this and they they might just say like, okay, so you want to provide data for hedge funds or for um, traders or people that want to build something like nomics.com or they want to build an app or whatever it is. Uh, is this overkill? I, you have to be dreaming up like more that... Uh, that this will be uh, in terms of the entire market, like beyond a yeah. whole bunch of uh, you know weird crypto assets that most should die, um, other than Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some large caps. Like, do we really need this data? What else do you imagine in terms of uh, yeah. being able to fit into your ecosystem? Like, yeah. you have a you have a grand vision of the future. It seems. Yeah, like. yeah, to- totally, totally. So, um, so there's a couple functions that we want to serve. Uh, one is we we want to be like the Internet Archive of the new financial system. Um, so archiving all of these dead coins, all of these markets that have expired, like we we want to tell the story and and the history of what was happening when all of this started to to come onto the scene. Uh, I think a second thing is that um, you know, perhaps this is overkill for what we have right now, but what we're what we're intending to build is the data backbone for the new financial world, right? For for the open financial system, and uh, and and we take that very seriously. Um, also, I think um, you know, right now there's not a lot of data. I mean, we perhaps there is. We've got we've indexed billions of trades, but um, you know. That that trend that we saw, where we indexed five exchanges and had eighty percent of the volume, and now you know you need to have twenty exchanges to even have fifty percent of the volume. Uh, I see that trend continuing, especially especially with the explosion of decentralized exchanges mm-hmm. uh, and uh, decentralized, you know, multiple versions of local bitcoins uh, that are reporting their data. Then OTC desks, uh, and then add to that. Um, uh, Add to that uh, security token exchanges. So imagine someday every single like local coffee shop, pizza shop, anyone who wants to fundraise in this way, every single like you know building in your city has a token, and that token is perhaps traded on some kind of uh, local exchange. There's just going to be an explosion of ex- exchanges, and then add to that uh, order book data. So. Uh, you know, data for orders that haven't been filled or have been canceled, or maybe they've the order's been placed and that order converts to uh, an actual trade, uh, and then add to that blockchain data, and uh, you have a, a huge uh, undertaking in terms. And that's of- all. That's all underlying physical product, right? Like that's the asset itself. That doesn't even get into um, a future. Where there's derivative products or futures oh or gosh. options, there's right. a whole other set of trades and orders and everything. So y'all intend to, y'all want to y'all want to support all of that in someday, yep. right? 
And oh no, and we are, and we have specs to to handle that right now. So if you if you're from a blockchain project, if you're from an exchange, if you're from an OTC desk, and you want to integrate your data with us, uh, let us know. We we have specs for you to write to. If you can stand up a you know like three endpoints, pretty simple endpoints, um, we can give you a heck of a lot of exposure. Um, so yeah, we're 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 doing all that, and then add to that. Um, you know, different indexes, so index fund indexes or crypt, various crypto versions of the S and P 500, uh, which we're indexing, uh, and then we're going to be ranking uh, and indexing performance of bots on different bot engines. So each of those bots are going to have their own rankings. Um, there's there's quite a future. <laughs> so there's this a, seems like an exponential explosion of uh, data that's going to be on your ecosystem. How are you? How are you looking to be able to scale that? Like, is this built on just a regular old database? I mean, what is it, what's this look yeah. like? Yeah, I mean, so kind of the the latest is uh, using uh, Kafka and Cassandra, and uh, that's that's what we're building on. So yeah, we don't we don't we're like we're not using Microsoft Access. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not. But. So um, kind of kind of these these large uh, non relational non relationable uh, wide column store databases that can handle you know trillions upon trillions of data points is, is that's that's how you got to do it. And then uh, I don't want to get too much in the weeds. I want to start asking about okay. like <laughs> uh, the output side. But I assume that for someone consuming this, y'all have a, a REST API is the way they're doing that, yeah. or is it GraphQL or something? Um, yeah, so people like there. We just haven't had enough interest in GraphQL, but yeah, it's 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 a RESTful API. Uh, there's no rate limiting, so we cache the hell uh, we cache the hell out of our our endpoints. Uh, so you can hit us as hard as you want. We don't like we don't care. Uh, go go nuts. <laughs> okay. um, a lot a lot of people charge for uh, quite a bit for these sort of uncapped. Um, Non rate limited APIs, but uh, yeah, we we won't rate limit you, and that's that's another thing that no one else will will do. Uh, that that we do is is we we don't rate limit. And you're just assuming either that that's worth eating the cost for now, or the cost is uh, somewhat nominal for now, uh, so that you uh, expect the you expect your paid customers will be able to absorb that function for the long haul. Uh, yeah. So so a couple things. One, uh, we're really good at caching. Uh, second, uh, we just want to win uh, in in the short term, so we want people to feel comfortable using us. Uh, and and uh, and third, uh, like I'm I'm funding this myself, uh, so but uh, in the long term, the you know the way we're modeled, uh, you know the the big cost is not you know having an uncapped, uh, you know uh, like the big cost is not that we're not rate limiting it here. It's it's engineers, <laughs> right? So. Uh, we probably could have led with this, but I think people have probably gotten the picture by now. But you're a this is a centralized business with a yep. open API, and um, there's no token. There's none of that stuff. You're not a crypto project, um, <laughs> unless someday maybe yep. you tokenize Nomics.com as a security. But this is a this is a normal old business, not like a, a blockchain project itself. It's not token based or anything like that. Right. Yeah. So we're using we're using centralized databases. We're a central centralized company. You know, I, I'm a big believer in that. Like, not everything needs to be decentralized or run on a blockchain. And and I actually think that what we're doing is kind of a horrible candidate for uh you know for the blockchain. It's just a, it's a terrible yeah. blockchain. Use if you case. need, especially if you need information back uh, quickly and reliably. Yeah. You want you know you want uh, millisecond. Um, you know, response times on APIs. Yeah, you 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 probably don't don't want to use a blockchain. So uh, yeah, at, at some point, uh, maybe we'll we'll tokenize equity of the company and and uh, let let people uh, buy it buy a piece of of what we're doing. But for now, this is just kind of like we want to be really good at the boring basics, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's what we're focused on. In addition to all of this, um, you're. Doing a podcast called Flippening. Um, I just listened to a three part series that y'all put out about security tokens and uh, probably tripled my knowledge of uh, not only what, you know, I kind of had an idea of what security tokens' potential was, but more about like 
who who are the players within the security token landscape and what do they envision and how do they differ from each other? So people might hear of Polymath because it has a token, but people uh, should also be aware of something like Harbor and they provide a different type of exper- uh, service than what Poly does. And then uh, Bruce Fenton was on your show, who's a big uh, like Ravencoin guy. Um, and they're going to have stuff on top of a platform on Ravencoin, but he created a security token for his company on Counterparty through Bitcoin. It's like, there's already all these tools for security tokens. So you just did this huge deep dive. Um, Why are you spending, like, I thought about how much time Clay must have spent making this podcast, because each episode's got like half a dozen guests edited down into the questions, like, how much time are you spending on this stuff, and why? Like, what's your what's your basis for for doing uh, such an in depth series like that? I all all in that was at least 150 hours. Like, I'm 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 embarrassed how much time that that series took. Uh, yeah, so that was just one of these stupid ideas where I was like, I, you know what, I'm going to do a, uh, I want to do an audio documentary. I, I had heard a really good audio documentary about uh, cryptocurrencies. And there was a part of me as a product person, you know, that re- respects the craftsmanship that said to myself, like, I want to create something that is like planet money level content for the cryptocurrency space uh, about uh, security tokens. And kind of the genesis of that was I interviewed uh, one company, I interviewed Polymath about security tokens. And I got this, just this fraction of a picture of what was happening. And then I realized, there's exchanges and there are issuers and there were like just so many regulatory bodies and there are so many different components to this um, because there's already a, a, a pretty mature financial system that deals with securities already. So uh, I, I couldn't do just one interview. So I started booking all these interviews and then I realized that uh, it was too late. That once I interviewed the people, now I had a commitment to publish them. But it didn't make sense to publish all these interviews by themselves because they really didn't stand on their own. I needed to weave a narrative through it. And then I needed to write a narrative, which means I needed to <laughs> So you backed your way into this and, whole documentary. Oh, God. And then I had to uh, storyboard out the whole thing. It was, it was, it was really a pain in the ass. Uh, but um, w- the interesting thing is, after I finished that, I, f- I figured out what my workflow was for creating these. And I realized, like, I, I kind of figured out how I could do one in a third of the time next time. So I'm probably going to be doing another stupid one uh, here in the future. So is the purpose behind these that you just want to share what you're learning and uh, you know traditional podcast stuff, or is this a, a is this marketing for Nomics? It's is marketing, it a whole it's marketing for Nomics. Yeah, it's no, okay. it's, it's it's marketing not for Nomics. So um, the the it's it's really the only podcast for institutional crypto investors. Like there's there's no podcast that has more listenership and more coverage from the institutional crowd than uh, than than flipping. And so that's that's exactly who our target audience is. So everyone who's paid for the API so far has found us through the podcast. Um, okay. So you know because I don't have a big content marketing team, we can't churn out a bunch of um, you know thought pieces or tutorials. Uh, I was like, there's just me. If I can do one thing that's going to attract the kind of audience that that I want to get, what can I do? And it was like, it was create this podcast. Because I, I started evaluating like how much time does CoinDesk spend to put on Consensus or Consensus Invest? And um, and, and it's it's millions of dollars. I've I've thrown big events before, and, uh, and they make I started millions looking of dollars too. And yeah, and they make millions of dollars too. Uh, I I but. Having come from the event business, I bet they're just doing better than break even. That's my prediction. I could be completely wrong, but I bet they're just doing better, even with how it's monetized. I bet you they're just doing uh, a little bit better than break even in New York, in like in Times Square. Like, uh, yeah. I, that's my I've prediction. Run small, I've run small events, and it's like enormous energy and very little money <laughs> is right. what it ends up as most of the time. Yeah. So, so I was, I was doing the stats on my podcast and every single episode was getting about 50,000 downloads. And I was like, well, there was like, you know, 12,000 people at Consensus Invest. So I, I bet I'm getting just as much coverage with that podcast from the crowd, from this very niche uh, institutional investor crowd. Uh, so the, the ROI for me really made sense. And so even though, uh, it's, it's a pain in the ass that I love to do. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to still do, you know, continue doing it. Um, who do you consider an institutional investor in the space? Like, 
is that hedge funds or is that uh, family like a family office? You know, somebody with a million dollars to spend on crypto, or what's yeah. what's what's an institutional investor to you? So, so I I define institutional investor as someone who uh, raises money from other parties, uh, to, you know, to, to invest it on their behalf. Um, okay. Usually, you know, they're uh, you know they're they're they they filed as a sort of a reg D fund or you know they're 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 usually regulated in some way uh so they're not just playing with their own money so a a family office is technically not an institutional investor but some of these family offices have you know billions under management so they it's kind of like they walk like a duck they talk like a duck and 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 you know they they have that level of rigor to what they do uh they've got an entire staff and stuff so um so yeah, uh, institutional investors are, are. What are some of the What are some of the big lessons that you've learned based on the people you've talked to in terms of uh, what's most concerning to a institutional investor? And let's level that up, like the higher end ones, not the like. For instance, I know custody is an issue for real institutional investors, whereas uh, for a lot of people with a little less on the line, they can kind of manage custody in house. But if you're a regulated entity custody becomes uh, significantly more important. So like, what kind of lessons for those types of people do you think uh, yeah. you've been able to yeah, come so, with? So, so custody, custody is definitely the big one. Um, the, the next one is just like deep markets. So you know, being able to make a block trade, you know, if you want to buy $30 million worth of Bitcoin uh, <laughs> without just like burning through the order books and uh, moving the market, so that you know, that's where good OTC desks come in. You know, you place a phone call, you arrange the price ahead of time, and then you do the trade. Um, so, like you know, OTC desks and clearing houses are are probably the the next, uh, uh, you know, the the next point of concern. Um, and then it's just it's just good 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 projects. I mean, they're they're uh, it's 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 hard for a lot of these folks to find. Um, coins other than Bitcoin and Ethereum that have enough like liquidity and market depth for them to to feel comfortable and just like you know history. It's just do you the, think? You know, do you think topics. people that come from traditional markets are having a hard time grasping um, the mix of speculation versus fundamental value in projects? Um, because I think what one of the things I'm seeing is like a lot of a lot of stuff is way down. To where if this was a traditional market with where the the market is fairly efficient and understanding what pricing is and what what works, um, they'd look like deals, right? Yeah. Yet if you look at a lot of coins now, like they could be down eighty percent uh, and still be overvalued because of the significant cooling off period. And I've gone through this lesson myself as a trader because. <laughs> You're like, I'm gonna buy the dip. <laughs> yeah, well, stuff just doesn't go down eighty percent quite like that in in traditional markets. So, do you think it's a learning curve for people trying to learn how to invest in crypto versus investing in 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 the real world, if you will? Yeah, so that's yeah, a good question. I think everyone's focused on the fact that these things are tokens, and you know, kind of forgetting about the real world uh, analogy. So, uh, a lot of these hedge funds really aren't doing forex trades, right? But uh, in a lot of ways, like that's what Bitcoin is. Is it's it's a forex thing. There's no underlying value. You're you're placing a bet on uh, on the network and the utility value of the coin. So it's it's really hard to evaluate, um, you know, what it is because you're. It's not like a security where there's this underlying asset, and then you can try and figure out what that underlying asset is worth. Um, and then you know, with things like Filecoin and crypto commodities. Um, that's that just looks like a lot like VC. You're 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 buying something based on the the future value of that. But uh, the hard thing there with crypto commodities like Filecoin is it, you know it doesn't matter how much utility value exists that like the amount of there's a lot of hard drive space in the world, right? So just mm-hmm. because it's tokenized doesn't mean that you know uh, all of a sudden this thing is worth more. So I, I think um, folks uh, in general need to. Not focus as much on the fact that it's a token or it's the whole thing is some new asset class. I, I don't think of this as uh, a new asset class. I think of I think of what's happening is tokenized versions of the analogous thing that exists in in the real world. And there's so many different versions of that. There's there's uh, there's tokenized securities that represent uh, equity in a company. 
There's, um, there's this new financial system. There's true cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. There's Ethereum, which is this who knows what the hell Ethereum is. I, I couldn't even tell you. I was you about to it. ask, how would you, how would you com- give an analogy for um, a protocol or a network with a value? Because in the, in the web or whatever, uh, open source software, historically, it, we don't really assign monetary value directly to the platform, a protocol, uh, an API, like whatever. Um, but that's what we're doing in crypto. So, yeah, that one, that yeah, one is, I, I agree with you completely. Even though I've always said like this is a whole new asset class, <laughs> it, <laughs> it, I agree with you that at at the base layer, it is it's it's a business represented by a token or whatever else. Um, yeah. But except for this protocol side of things, and it's weird yeah. for me. Like, and I guess maybe that's why the market's inefficient and why we're seeing these drastic swings is because. We're trying to figure out like what is something like the zero X protocol worth, uh, yeah. or, or what is uh, EOS or Ethereum worth, um, and we have this ability to put a monetary value on them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of times the monetary value is just that uh, you know the greater fool is going to come on and buy it, buy it for more, and that's <laughs> that is the yeah. value of the token. <laughs> Um, yeah, I musical think, chairs I think, is not a game I want to play, uh, <laughs> but it's a game. I agree. Like it does seem like we're all all playing it, you know, and we're just hoping that some other sucker is going to be the one left without a chair. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I go to Vegas every once in a while. I don't, you know, as long as you know what you're doing. I, I think I think there's something real about Bitcoin. I think there's something real about Ethereum. Um, you know, I, I think something that is um, not discussed enough with regards to Ethereum is the fact that there's these compound or like kind of second order network effects that occur. So everyone talks about the the network effects of Bitcoin, you know, the it's it's like Visa, the more people that accept Visa, the more valuable Visa is. Same with phones, owning a phone makes owning a phone more valuable to to everyone, you know, every time one is purchased or you know, Facebook, I think people generally get um, network effects. Um, there's another effect at play, the Lindy effect, which is you just sort of the value of something that doesn't break uh, increases with every sort of unit of time that it continues to not break. You know, we develop more trust in the system. That's the Lindy effect. Uh, but I think se- se- second order network effects occur with platforms like Ethereum, where uh, Ether itself has network effects, but then built on top of Ethereum are these additional tokens that themselves have network effects. And I, I really think there's something to that. Um, there's just so much developer activity on top of Ethereum. The transaction volume is there. And um, like kind of the long tail, the combined long tail of the network effects of the tokens built on Ethereum is just tr- truly outstanding where like none of them individually on their own uh, Maybe have world changing network effects just yet, but the cumulative power uh, makes you know it makes ethereum extremely defensible and so um, you know i 'm not a, a philosopher or an economist and, and i don 't spend all all my time writing up uh, you know medium posts about this, but there 's something really, really powerful about what 's happening with ethereum and, and i, I don 't know if necessarily all that accrues to the token or how this all plays out, but I, I think there 's something special happening. So network effects uh, to me makes sense. I come from open source software, so I understand the power of uh, hey, other people use this, so I'm going to use this. And someone could say, oh, well, this other thing's better, newer, fancier, whatever. And you're like, I don't care. Other people use this. I'm going to use this. I can find developers yeah. who build on this, uh, etc. Like it's a known thing. I get it, and I understand it, and it makes sense. So your point is that Ethereum is uh, benefiting from some of these same things. And just because something else comes along and they're like, oh, well, we scale twenty percent better, or you know, some other some other benefit that we have, yeah. um, someone is going to have to uh, truly compete with Ethereum on that front. In your yeah. opinion, like it, to me, it's a, it's kind of analog, uh, analogous to JavaScript, right? So uh, JavaScript kind of is is at the baseline of 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 the or at the at the at the base of web programming, and then you have all these frameworks built on top of it, like. Uh, uh, Angular and React and uh, you know Dude. Aurelia or like yeah. a bajillion of these uh, you know TypeScript what have you and uh, each each of these uh, you know like React in particular has a, a lot of network effects going for it 
Uh, mm -hmm. But those ne network effects only reinforce JavaScript, right? <laughs> it only right. reinforces JavaScript's network effects, in my opinion. So the, par the parallel could be, um, let's say, 0x. I apologize for shilling. I don't, have a, I don't own any ZRX right now. <laughs> uh, but let's say 0x becomes like the way to create a decentralized exchange just because their protocol is that good. Now all decentralized exchanges are essentially using uh, 0x, which is built on Ethereum. So the the... Or or crypto kitties like gaming. Gaming becomes very popular through crypto kitties or some other thing. Um, because of that, it's reinforcing the underlying network, uh, so they're self strengthening. So the more stuff that gets built on Ethereum, the more likely Ethereum creates that stronghold. Even if like everybody believes it's garbage, like it just it doesn't necessarily matter as long as that's what people keep building on and the developer ecosystem builds around. Yeah, I, I'm. There are plenty of people that would say JavaScript is garbage, <laughs> but it is JavaScript used by every website on the world. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, or, or you know, I hear this all the time. People talk about WordPress. Like, oh, have you 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 know, have you seen this other super amazing CMS? It's got this markdown. And it's so much faster. WordPress is crap. Nobody cares. Nobody, nobody cares. cares. Because you can go to any, and I come from this space, so Clay's uh, feeding me here. Uh, but you can go to any ad agency, any interactive agency in the world, pretty much, and you say, my website's on WordPress, and they're like, they'll say, okay, well, we can build on that. Because it's a PHP and MySQL application, it's straightforward, and people have experience building on it. So it doesn't matter how good your, your fancy content management system is, because... Uh, everyone in the world has a, a knowledge and an understanding of WordPress and they can build on WordPress. And we're yeah. seeing the same thing happen with some of these protocols. Uh, the first mover advantage is fascinating. What I'll be really truly, like the most fascinating thing will be to me, not if Ethereum dominates, because that should be expected, it will be who can actually challenge them. So like, can someone else like Netscape Ethereum and become mm -hmm. you know, Chrome or whatever else? That would That would really... Really make uh, this stuff interesting yeah. to me. I, I, I think I think what's what's difficult about that is that like the switching cost. There's there's just such a pain of disconnect if you like if you're zero x to switch to another blockchain is just damn near uh, impossible. I don't want to speak for those guys, but switching to a new blockchain once you've done everything on top of Ethereum or you know a given platform. Is is quite is just quite an undertaking, and you know you have to reissue tokens and and uh, get all your users to like n like not succumb to apathy. It is just uh, it, it's just a big uh, pain in the ass, really. Yeah, and I know a lot of these uh, projects to try to essentially hedge that risk are trying to build their own stuff like a layer above, like so a little agnostic mm -hmm. of the underlying platform. Um, so that if yeah. someone integrates with their API, um, they can change their underlying stuff. But whoever's integrating with them can still like basically do the same layer. Thing. Yeah, that abstraction layer to try to protect from that, um, yeah. because it's still possible that Ethereum just blows up one day. Like it's totally possible. This is a new ecosystem. You seem excited to track it all. Uh, I wanted to have you on just to talk about what you're yeah. building with Nomics. I love the cool. fact that it's just centralized and you're doing data. I think that's. Uh, Really cool. I think the fact that you're offering so much in a free API, uh, my listeners that are interested in building and stuff like that, check it out. Uh, I've checked it out, planning on using it for some uh, work that I have going on. And uh, it's really cool. The Flippening Podcast has me hooked. Um, so y'all go cross subscribe. Make sure you subscribe to both, not just Flippening, not just <laughs> Ledgercast. Subscribe to both. Um, and Clay, mm -hmm. I look forward to just uh, keeping an open channel and and learning more about what you're working on and what you're thinking about. I think you bring a lot to the space and I'm thankful for you coming on and spreading across a lot of topics today, but I, I, I enjoyed it. So thanks for doing that. Awesome, awesome. me too. And just a shout out, if you, if you run an exchange or an OTC desk, yeah, you know, yeah. we, we want to do a, a deep data integration with you. So that's, that's who I'm talking yeah. to. You. I'll, uh, and I'll second that. I mean, the way that you've talked to me about how... Um, People can do relatively small changes to their own APIs, just providing endpoints for specific types of access for you. Um, one of the things that makes sense for me uh, is that if an exchange doesn't want to support like every little app and every everybody that wants to come and uh, 
you know, ping their systems and deal with them and all that and all the support that can come along with that. You're essentially telling the exchange, hey, we'll do that. We'll, we'll manage that component for you if you just help us uh, grab this data a little easier. Yeah, so we're we're actually um, we're working with an exchange right now on a on a white label version of their API that everyone is going to think comes from them, and so they're just providing us with like three endpoints. And on top of that, we're giving all of their customers like candlestick data and like all time high data and all kinds of different market feeds and stuff. Um, so that's so their yeah, that's API something. is actually going to come directly from you. Yeah, I mean, their users won't know it, but yeah, we're yeah. we're powering all of that. So they just expose like a few simple endpoints. And their customers get like you know multiple dozens of of endpoints that they can use to analyze that on their exchange, which uh, is a, a good marketing channel for them. That's really cool. Well, I uh, look forward to seeing um, what all this looks like when you've got uh, you know hundreds more exchanges and derivatives products and securities and all this stuff on there, and talk to you about how what your data management uh, journey is looking like at that time. I'm sure it'll be. I'm sure it'll be something. Uh, Clay, thanks for coming on, and we will uh, catch everybody next time. Monuments crumble in the blink of an eye. The easy river has just run dry.